Hi, David Bizard here. You are watching Power Attack 10. Give me a few minutes of your time, and I promise in return to give you the benefit of 50 years. No, make that nearly 60 years of race winning experience. Now, for this episode, which is episode 51, um, I've come to a bit of a writer's block, so to speak. My last video took so long to do, that was the one on uh, uh, how to build a race winning uh, 383 on a tight budget, that uh, I've only managed to get two videos out this month and here we are almost at the end of the month. So I began to look through what videos I haven't done part two of and I guess the quickest one for me to do here is part two of the crankshaft one. Um, how to, how to balance your crankshaft and make that crank a little bit more effective in operation. And all of this hinges on where we take metal from the crank when we balance it. So let's go straight to the drawing board and look at that. What we see here is the basic system which we're going to balance. This counterbalance weight here has to offset uh, acceleration forces developed by the motion of this piston up and down the bore as driven by the crankshaft during its rotation. Let's be clear here, we can't completely balance a reciprocating load with a rotating offset rotating mass but what we can do is by connecting lots of cylinders as we have in a v8 we can offset some of the reciprocating forces on one cylinder with those on another but that's getting into uh, an area that uh, that i'm not um, uh, looking to get into here what we're going to do is look at the most effective way of balancing this mass here with that mass there. I'm going to make my first move here to simplify things by removing everything out of this drawing a part at a time so that we're just left with the crank and the uh, crank pin here. So here goes. Well here we are with just the rotating assembly. What I'm going to do now is remove the piston and then the rod. And here we are down to the uh, crank and rod. So out goes the rod. Now here we are with just the crank and the outlines of the main bearing and the big end. Now to make things easier to explain I'm going to rotate this so that these are on a vertical axis like that. So here goes. I want to make the first move here is for you to imagine that this crankshaft is perfectly balanced, i.e. this counterbalance weight here exactly meets the needs to balance the bob weight that goes on here. And the bob weight, of course, is uh, a function of the rod weight and the piston weight. Now, think about this. If we spin this, it doesn't vibrate at all. Now let's see what happens if we add a weight on just here and here. Exactly the same weights and exactly the same positions either side of the center line. Like so. Here are the two weights added. Right along the center line, the horizontal center line. Now, if the crank was balanced before, you can see that adding this weight here and this one exactly opposite here has no effect on the balance of the crank. So we've added weight to the crank but haven't disturbed the balance. Now let's move these two weights up to here. So, like so. Now, our two additional masses there are adding 
to the effect of the counterweight. They had no effect on balance here, but when moved around 90 degrees so that they are directly in line with the big end here, they have the maximum effect on out of balance. In other words, to counteract that balance there, we'd have to add that same weight to here. Well, we're not in the business of adding weight, we're in the business of removing weight. So let's look at how we should best remove this out of balance mass. If you'd taken this to have a perfectly normal balance job done, which would be the cheapest way of doing it, your machine shop would drill a hole in here like this to offset, to, to remove excess metal here to balance the crankshaft. When we design a crankshaft, there's two things we're trying to reduce, and that is the mass of the crankshaft and its windage. As it happens, we could have put this in a lathe and turned off this here. That would have removed more metal in terms of weight than we'd have to drill out by this here. Remember any weight around here doesn't affect the balance much. Now if this mass was here, if we removed the equivalent of this mass here and here, we'd have to remove a lot more. Let me show you how that would appear. Well here's one weight moved. You'll notice it's bigger. The further the weight from here moves around here, the heavier it has to get to offset the out of balance that was here. If we move this weight all the way around to here, then an infinite mass would not balance that crank. So that means if that crank had that mass, we could take an infinite amount off of it. Now let me move the other one round as well. You can now see that, or hopefully you can now see that, now I've moved both out of balance masses to here to have the same amount of out of balance as I had here, I've had to make these bigger, right? The more I move this around, the bigger those out of balance masses have to be to equal what was there. Now let's reverse that. Let's say it's already out of balance and I had to drill a hole like so to make it work. Now let's uh, look at this in a more practical form now. Let's say your crank was out of balance and drilling a hole here put it in balance, right? So we'll say that you drilled out eight grams. Well, if the holes were drilled here and here, you'd have to drill out about 16 grams. So now your crank is eight grams lighter. From this, we conclude that the further round we take the metal off here, the more we have to take off to balance the cranks out of balance weight due to the big end rod and piston. So our preferred places to remove metal are towards here and here. So if we haven't, if we're showing an out of balance here, we take some metal off here and here so that we end up taking the most off. We've got two things to combat here, the weight of the crank and its windage. Now if the crank's way out of balance, one of the first things you can do is turn the OD of the crank so that this is smaller. That gets rid of a lot of weight uh, in itself and the only weight that's 100% effective in offsetting the out of balance here will be here. Everything else here gets less effective. When it's over here, uh, 10 grams removed from about here and here has about the same effect as two grams removed from there. So what we want to do then is balance our crankshaft with the preferred metal 
as shown in the next diagram. What you see here is a simplified diagram of the areas that are best subjected to metal removal. The wider this is here, the more effective the uh, metal removal is for both dropping windage and a moment of inertia. Now, the out of balance mass may not be here, may not be centered here. It may be over here. So, so for, for something here, you would take off material here and you could probably get quite a lot off here because it's so far away it would have to do for, for um, uh, the effect to take uh, uh, any significance. One of the things you'll see with crankshafts is a hole drilled in the middle here. Well, not quite in the middle, right? Now that is very good for crank balancing and it increases the strength of the crank as well. That was a development that Rolls-Royce did for the Merlin cranks during or just prior to World War II. Okay, so let's look at this in more practical terms now. You've got to grind some metal off here, right? rather than drill holes. Try not to drill holes, but grind these leading edges here and here and gradually work your way around. Knife edging these so that it directs the oil towards the mains cap is the way to do it. I balanced the stock uh, GM crank, cast crank, it was a throwaway item, it was a good one, low mileage. I drilled out the big end and I started machining this down until I'd got a lightweight rodden piston assembly balanced. I managed to take nearly half an inch off of here in the lathe plus uh, metal rounding this off here and knife edging it right put a hole in here uh, uh, and uh, also the, here on a lot of cranks especially forged ones it gets very untidy so grind the metal off here and just leave that uh, bearing surface there so that you lighten this end as well um, if you look at your crank you'll see a lot of places metal can come off right but that's the way to do it um, I took the crank up to uh, show John Callis what I'd done here and we put it on the Callis um, uh, moment of inertia machine and it turned out my cast iron crank was actually had less moment of inertia than any of the commonly available lightweight race cranks. How did it last? The question is how long is all this lightweight stuff going to last? Well, to be honest, as for this uh, crankshaft's lifetime, I can't make any guarantees. Here's what happened. I did this crankshaft and we tested it in a restrictor plate motor. Seemed fine. Oh, and I forgot to say, we did have the crank heat treated. I can't remember the name of the company concern but they were in the uh, Riverside um, uh, area kind of and uh, the heat treatment they did was a, uh, a deep surface treatment uh, that kind of uh, toughened up the outside of the crank as well as putting an anti-friction layer into the first ten thousandths of the crank. We ran this in a restrictor plate motor two barrel not a restrictor plate two barrel class motor we did a few uh, races with that and it seemed okay. Uh, then um, I took it out the engine and I put it into a dyno mule and it lasted quite a few tests on there, at least 200 pulls. Um, so that's where we got to. And then after that, 
I moved to the Caribbean. And so for the first time in my life for many, many, many years, I did not have a dyno. Anyway, all of the mods that were done in terms of balancing it would have no negative effects on the crank's uh, life. Now, putting the hole in the big end, which, which, which is what I did, may not have been optimum. I just shoved the hole in there with no regard to uh, uh, much else. So how well I did that or did not do it is questionable. Uh, I guess if you wanted to be safe, you could probably put a three quarter inch hole in that big end uh, of each of those and make the crank actually better. So there you have it. Now a balanced job like this is worth power. Uh, I'm going to have to make a guess here based on experience with testing uh, other cranks back and forth. But typically we could expect to see a crank like this have the same effect as at least a 15 horsepower increase. Now this won't show necessarily on the dyno, but the rotating mass in the engine dropped considerably when this crank was used. So uh, that's going to be an asset there. At the time, John Callis had got um, a formula which worked in conjunction with the uh, machine that measured the moment of inertia. It hung, it was on a spring, and it went backwards and forwards like this, and you timed how long it took to go from uh, a certain amplitude of oscillation down to a lesser one. Anyway, he put all this into his equation and he said that the crank was worth about five feet per lap on a typical quarter mile track. Right, so in a 20 lap race, you'd be 50 feet, sorry, 100 feet further down the track than you would have been with the crank stock. Now, consider this. Beating your competition by 100 feet in a 20 lap race, that's not too bad, right? That's a healthy winning margin, just from the difference of a crank. Okay, that's all I've got to say now, and uh, I hope you uh, liked this. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and notify. Thank you for watching.